to the book of Daniel chapter 6 if you want to uh, open your Bibles there. This is kind of the classic Daniel uh, in, in the lion's den. But uh, I hope we'll see that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more than Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel in the lion's den is, is no more about uh, Daniel and lions as uh, Jonah is about big fish. Uh, it, it's really, as we've seen in the book of Job, the book of Job is really not about Job and his suffering. It's about Job and his relationship with the Lord. Uh, here, the issue of the lions only show us what we've already seen from Daniel now uh, in his 80s. We met him as a young teenager, 15, 16 years old in this captivity, and we saw his uh, incredible integrity. Uh, and that's what we continue to see in uh, at this point in time, at, at what will be chronologically the, the last glimpse of him at the end of his life. Now, as we continue uh, next week and go on into chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, then we actually chronologically go back in time, and he begins to tell us about visions and dreams and prophecies, things that are going to be happening uh, in, the, in the future. But this is kind of a look at the end of his life, and it's really a look at his, uh, his integrity and some things that we can learn from it. There was a, a book out recently called Freakonomics uh, by Stephen Levitt that uh, basically is uh, dealing with the, uh, the issue sometimes of, of that when there's a breakdown in, in honesty and integrity in the workplace, it, it affects the workplace, uh, it affects the, the economics of, of that, that business and really uh, of our country. A couple of statistics, he said that uh, one that I thought was interesting uh, he said, considered what happened one spring evening at midnight in 1987. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but on a spring evening in 1987, 7 million children were suddenly disappeared. It was the worst kidnapping wave in history. No, actually, the Internal Revenue Service just changed their code. You used to be able to list kids as your dependents and get the deduction. And in 1987, it changed and now you actually had to take them down, get a social security number, provide some kind of ID, and then have that on your tax form. And suddenly, 7 million children disappeared that were there the year before. <laughs> oh, somebody was getting a few extra dollars on their, their tax returns there. Uh, another study by Duke University uh, interviewed 70,000 college high school students, uh, found it that 70% admit to, uh, to cheating, uh, 70%, uh, a separate poll of 25,000 high schoolers found that nearly half agreed with the statement, a person has to lie or cheat sometimes uh, in order to succeed. Uh, and what we find with Daniel is that's not true at all. This will be the second time he is elevated to the position of what we would consider prime minister, the second uh, most powerful, powerful person uh, in, again, first the... the uh, the Babylonian Empire, now under the Medo-Persian uh, Empire. But uh, uh, it, it happens in the church as well. Again, uh, there's a credibility gap sometimes when our words and our actions don't, uh, don't match. It was like the uh, police officer that had to pull a, a, a lady over, and, and she said, uh, what's wrong, officer? I, I, I wasn't speeding, wasn't I? And he goes, no, 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 you weren't speeding. Uh, that wasn't the problem. But uh, I, I've been following you for a while, and that one car... Uh, swerved out in front of you, and I saw you lay on your horn and kind of shake your finger at the guy and everything, and then uh, uh, another half a mile down the road when that Hummer pulled out in front of you, uh, I mean, you really laid out, shook your fist at the guy and, uh, and everything, and she said, well, that's not against the law, is it? He goes, oh, no, 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 it's just that I saw your bumper sticker that says Jesus loves you, and I do too, so I thought maybe this was a stolen car. I need to see your registration. There's a problem sometimes in terms of our own integrity within the church. Certainly there's a crisis uh, in our culture, but it affects us as, uh, as well. 
A couple things about Daniel when we met him in chapter 1 that we mentioned. We talked about that Daniel resolved not to defile himself. We talked about the fact that the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, basically changed his home, his textbooks, his menu, his name, but they could never uh, really change his heart. He refused to be conformed to uh, the pattern of the world that, uh, that he was in. And we also saw that he resolved or purposed in his heart not to defile himself in terms of the decisions that he made, despite that his parents weren't around. He didn't have the, always the influence of, uh, of good company. Remember, he was hanging out with the Harry Potter gang a lot. Those are the guys that he worked with. Um, it was just a personal decision and commitment that he made, and uh, ultimately he resolved to obey God's word. So let's take a look. There's five principles here. The first one is Daniel's integrity was leading to his promotion, and that's verses 1 to 9. Uh, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, um, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree, put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. So the king uh, planned on promoting Daniel uh, at this point, and he wanted to put him in charge. Uh, And uh, basically what it says is because he suspected that these other guys were ripping him off. Uh, there was a little problem with the finances here and probably some kickbacks and briberies going on. But Daniel distinguished himself and he realized that if I'm going to end this corruption, Daniel was one of the three uh, presidents or, or again, administrators over this area of Babylon. But he wanted to make him the, in charge of everything. Uh, that word gets out. And so uh, there's the jealousy and the concern for their own power and positions and, uh, and so forth. I want to do a, a backtrack a little bit because um, uh, just to, uh, we've, we've addressed as we've gone through the book from time to time, uh, a, the critics look at the book of Daniel because it does tell us history uh, in advance and therefore uh, the liberal critic would say, therefore it must have a late dating, this Daniel can't be the Daniel that was the author and, and so on and so forth and we've looked at some of those things to show credibility to how accurate Daniel was. Uh, at the same time, uh, one of the critics uh, would, uh, uh, for a long time, the critics leveled that uh, there was a problem here because they would say, uh, you know, we can't find in any of the histor- uh, historical documents uh, any person named Darius that, that ruled uh, as a Mede over the, um, the uh, province uh, in the city of, of Babylon. And um, again, if you wait for archaeology long enough, it finally catches up with, with the Bible. A couple of things that are uh, interesting here, uh, and not to belabor it, but uh, we find later from, uh, from uh, secular writers like Josephus and Herodias that the term Darius just means one who holds the scepter. So it's the person that's in charge. Uh, it's not the, the man's actual name. We know from historical documents that Darius' real name is Gubaru, G-U-B-A-R-U. Uh, It's also interesting because, again, we find that he is a Mede, just like the Bible said. He is appointed, not by conquest, because Cyrus is the the king of the Medo-Persian army and empire. He's the one that led the conquest. The other thing that's interesting uh, is that we find, again, from secular documents, that Gubadar was born in 601 B.C. That makes him 62 years old when he begins to take control, which... If you go back to the previous chapter when we're introduced to him, in verse 30 it says, 
That night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. It's interesting. That's like, and why was that important? <laughs> well, we don't know. But Daniel was into details, and all the details uh, line up. Very interesting. So again, Cyrus, and he is the ruler named by Isaiah the prophet about 400 years prior to his birth, that he would be uh, the king and the ruler over this Medo-Persian empire, that he would be the one that would release uh, the uh, Jewish captives to be able to go back to the land of Israel. Uh, and under him there is Darius, the one who sold, holds the scepter, who is a Mede, just the way the Bible said he would be. And, uh, and he's the, the person, or Gubaru, that we see uh, in our story here. But again, the king recognized the integrity of, uh, of Daniel. It says he distinguished himself by his exceptional qualities. Uh, again, honest, kept careful watch over the affairs of the state. Uh, even his, um, uh, his critics, verse uh, 4, they could find no corruption in him. He was trustworthy. Uh, it still happens today. We've, we've got uh, several uh, men at our church that hold positions primarily because their employers realize there's no corruption in them. Sometimes it's hard to find an honest person. Uh, one of our, our worship leaders for a couple of years was, um, was uh, uh, a, a man named uh, Sofa. And I, uh, big Samoan guy, I think his name actually was Sofa Sofa, but we just only called him Sofa. But uh, is, is that his first and his last name, Mark? Fayatala. Fayatala Sofa, okay. I think he has a brother, though, that it's first and last. But anyway, big football player, Nanakuli High School. But he, um, he went on and, uh, and became a professional golfer, and, man, he could crush a golf ball. <clears throat> Played on the Asian tour for uh, a number of years. And then he, uh, he took over. He was back home, and uh, uh, one of the, so he was a touring pro, and then he took over, over in, uh, in, in Maui from a friend to uh, be the director of golf while that guy was on vacation for you know, a month or so, and so he was over there at one of the courses in uh, Kapalua, and, um, and in part of doing that, um, you uh, you do some lessons, and he uh, had a, uh, a pretty wealthy Japanese man that he gave lessons to and kind of befriended and got to know a little bit and so forth, and this man realized that Sofa was a man of integrity. Sofa was very forthright in saying that he was a Christian. He followed Jesus Christ. Uh, and what a difference that it made. <laughs> He'd just share wherever he could, you know. And uh, this really impressed that guy. A number uh, of years later then, this man, Japanese businessman, went to build a golf course here in Oahu, the Kapolei Golf Course. Uh, and he wanted Sofa to run the golf course. And Sofa said, I'm a touring pro. I don't know anything about managing a golf course. He goes, that's okay. You can learn that. What I, I want you to do it because I can trust you. Uh, I need somebody that I can trust. Uh, and so he ends up taking that position. Uh, it still happens. People, even, even secular people like Darius, uh, like uh, this Japanese businessman, are looking for some honest men and women, people with uh, integrity they can entrust responsibility to. That's what we've got here. The other administrators recognize uh, the integrity of, uh, of Daniel as well. And, uh, and again, his lack of corruption <laughs> didn't exactly make him popular. Uh, it, it doesn't always today in the workplace. Matthew 5, 11, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those prophets, he's speaking certainly of, uh, of Daniel, uh, could find no corruption in him. What a, what a testimony for, uh, that that might be said of, uh, of us. Uh, God's got a plan that allows Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den. You know, we, we often look at our own sufferings and difficulties and we're saying, how can God allow this to happen? In reality, God sometimes just causes it to happen because he's got a different purpose and he's got a different plan in it, as we'll see uh, at the end of our chapter. But uh, again, Daniel's faithfully serving God doesn't mean that things go always uh, well for him, but certainly God is in the, the midst of it. Daniel's integrity was leading to a promotion. Secondly, Daniel was constant in prayer despite the issue of persecution, verse 10 to 12. Now when Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem three times a day. 
He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Uh, Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So uh, we first note that uh, Daniel refused to, uh, to compromise. This was just the pattern of his life. He, three times a day he would pray, three times a day he would, uh, he would pray uh, facing Jer- Jerusalem. And uh, I don't think there was any thought in his mind that, uh, well, let's see, 30 days, uh, I could not pray for 30 days. I mean, what, what's that going to hurt? I mean, lion's den, prayer, uh, I think I'll just skip the prayer. For, he, he doesn't do it. Uh, can you imagine uh, uh, for you, uh, if someone said, uh, would you not pray for a week? Because if you don't, you're gonna, we're going to execute you. You know, what, what would you be your decision to continue to pray? Uh, Daniel, I mean, he starts out as a 15-year-old kid with tremendous integrity. Here he's about 85. It's about 70 years later and still the same kind of uh, integrity, just a refusal to, to compromise. Uh, if you wonder if this is relevant or not, there's lots of places today where people tell us we can't pray. We got kids going to school every day that are told, you can't pray in class. You can't bow your head when you pray for your food in the cafeteria. Uh, this is, nobody's threatening to throw them to the lions, but uh, uh, certainly there are some lion-like people out there that are uh, against prayer. Uh, Daniel started his day, we notice, with the Lord. And I just want to, uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about this or realized that Jews prayed towards Jerusalem, uh, but it was uh, very common throughout the Psalms. Uh, we see it first in, in 1 King uh, 8.26. Uh, these are the words of Solomon after the temple is born. Uh, excuse, excuse me, after the temple is built. Verse 26, And now, O God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David, my father, come true. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plead for mercy, O Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in, the, in your presence this day. May your eyes be open towards this temple night and day. This place of which you said, my name shall be there, so that you will hear the prayer of your servant, praise toward this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place when you hear, forgive. And and you see that over and over in the Psalms. The Jews prayed towards uh, Jerusalem. And, um, and that's what David, uh, excuse me, what uh, uh, Daniel continued to do here. Uh, David in the Psalms, Psalm 55 uh, says, But I call to the Lord, uh, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. So this was a typical thing uh, for them, that they would pray in the morning, they would pray at noon, they would pray in the evening, and they would face towards uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and this continues... Uh, until Jesus has a conversation with a Samaritan woman by the well. Remember that conversation? He says, uh, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. You know, we, we worship where we should be worshiping. I'm paraphrasing here. In Jerusalem, towards Jerusalem, you're over here in Mount Gerizim, you know, really the wrong place. But you know what? It's not going to matter once the Messiah comes. And by the way, did I mention that I'm the Messiah? Now, that's my paraphrase, but that's what that conversation is about. That's why we don't line up the sanctuary, to, which way is Jerusalem? Because we worship Jesus, the, uh, the Messiah. But it was a big deal to them, and especially when you're taken out of that place and, and that temple that bore the name, the name of God where his physical presence, his Shekinah glory had been uh, up until that time. Uh, again, but prayer is not incidental in, in Daniel's life. It was the most essential thing in, uh, in Daniel's life. Uh, I want to say that again. Prayer was not an incidental thing in Daniel's life. It was the most essential thing in Daniel's life. Again, how are we going to have integrity in the workplace? Uh, you know, how does Daniel live in a really a, a radical culture? I mean, this is the, this is the birthplace of all idolatry is, is Babylon. 
Uh, this is not where you'd want to send your kid off to camp. You, you, you know what I mean? This is a, this is a very wicked place. Uh, there's lots of uh, uh, sorcerers and witchcraft going on, uh, you know, uh, some pretty heavy darkness here. How does a, a 15, 16-year-old kid maintain his integrity this whole, this whole time? Well, he met regularly with the Lord. In the morning, at noon, at night, crying out to the Lord, facing Jerusalem, where God had placed his name, his presence for uh, this covenant people of, of his, and he cried out to, to them. Uh, boy, that's how we maintain his integrity. Jesus, there's an interesting incident, incident with Jesus. Jesus comes down. You remember Jesus goes up with Peter, James, and John on the, uh, up in uh, northern Israel there, up on the mountain, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And he has that whole thing happen where uh, he's up there and, and he's transformed and, and, uh, and, and they see the whole thing. And, you know, Peter's can't, you know, foot and mouth disease thing. He, he's got the thing, you know, let's build three temples here. All that's going on. Uh, when they come down, though, do you remember the incident? The other disciples are down there. And uh, a man has brought his son who is demon-possessed. Uh, and they're, un they're unable to cast the demon out. Now, th they've done this many times. Jesus had sent them out, and they were amazed at the power that they had and so forth. But they're unable to cast the demon out. So, they, so they call on Jesus, and Jesus comes over and kind of rebukes them. You remember what he says? He says, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. And then Jesus casts the demon out. And of course, they all took out their daily timers and went, yeah, but that wasn't, like, that wasn't like on Wednesday morning. It wasn't scheduled, you know, cast demon out only by prayer fasting. So we lined it up, prayer fasting Tuesday. No, it wasn't. Do you understand what I'm saying? He, well, when do you know that's going to happen? You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know when it's going to happen. The, the obvious is this should be lifestyle stuff. Uh, Praying, waiting on the Lord on a regular basis, meeting with God, because you don't know what's going to happen uh, the next day. It would be very helpful, wouldn't it, if, uh, if we kind of got things uh, broadcast to us uh, uh, ahead of time and we knew what was coming up. Big temptation tomorrow. Okay, a little extra time with the Lord today. Thank you. I appreciate that. It doesn't, you notice it doesn't happen that way. Uh, they, find, they found out the same thing this week in the NFL. Uh, turns out that Bill Belichick and the Patriots were trying to do that. I don't know if you know the story. They got a guy filming the defensive coordinator on the other side as he calls in his signals, and they match it up with the overhead shots of the, uh, of the offense and defense and what's going on. So then they could watch, by the second quarter, they could watch him and then call into their offense, this is the play that's coming. Okay, I think we can have a pretty good day here then. If we know what they're doing, uh, you know, we know how to react and so forth. Satan isn't that way. God doesn't allow it. Uh, he doesn't always tell us ahead of time that today is the big day of temptation. Tomorrow's the day when you're going to meet someone that really needs to hear uh, something from the scripture that I want to share with you this morning. It's just the assumption that we will be meeting with the Lord on a regular basis. God will be speaking to our hearts. And then when that time comes, it's like, well, I just read in the Psalms this morning. Can I share this with you? Or I was just praying about this. I recognize the situation. I'm out of here. Or I can minister here or whatever it might be. Uh, the assumption is in the Christian life, like Daniel, if we're going to live lives of integrity in a very secular fallen world, it's, we're going to be able to do it only because... We're meeting with the Lord. Don't need to face Jerusalem. You have to carry a compass around with you. Uh, we worship the Messiah, uh, our risen Messiah that paid the price for our sins. But man, we need to, to meet with him if we're going to maintain our, our integrity. Uh, because of that, we realize this is not a crisis prayer meeting. <laughs> this is just what Daniel did. We kind of have those, right? I mean, the crisis comes up. It's like, oh no, let's pray. You know, and, and that's okay. You know, it's okay to have the crisis prayer meeting when something's going on, but uh, there needs to be something more than just, I pray in a crisis. There's got to be more to that in terms of a relationship with the Lord. Daniel's integrity was leading to a promotion, but he didn't allow the issue of persecution to prevent him from meeting with the Lord. And, and then three, Daniel could not be helped by a king with insufficient power. We see that in verses 13 to 18. Then they said to the king, Daniel... <clears throat> who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. 
He was determined to rescue Daniel and make, uh, made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation may not be, might not be changed. <clears throat> then the king returned to his place and spent the night without eating, without entertainment, <clears throat> no DVDs that night being brought to him, and he could not uh, sleep. Again, the king here is distressed over the news. He makes every effort to try to save Daniel, but he is unable. Now remember the, uh, the statue of, uh, of the different periods or uh, different empires. The head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar. He is the, the most powerful. Next is this kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, the silver. Less in value, less in power. Nebuchadnezzar pretty much could call the shots, do whatever he wanted to do. Not so with, with this kingdom. It's, it's really run by this hierarchy. And this, though he is the king, the ruler over this province, once he puts something in writing, he can't do anything about it. He's got uh, insuff insufficient power to really help Daniel as much as he would like to him. Remember, he's just getting ready to, to put Daniel as the head guy. He's the only guy he can... Uh, he can even trust, but he's already given the order to have him uh, thrown in, uh, in, in the lion's den. Notice also when they came to him they, with the decree, they said, uh, Now, O king, uh, all of us, all the administrators, all the satraps, all the prefects, we've all met and we've all agreed on this. Was that true? That wasn't true. Somehow I think they kind of forgot Daniel in, in on that conversation. I don't think he had a vote on that one as far as uh, not praying for, for 30 days. The enemy can be very uh, dece uh, deceitful. Darius falls for it, signs the thing, and now has insufficient power to really, really help Daniel, but that's okay. You know, sometimes we're, we're in the midst of our, our, our anguish and, and distress. We're looking for a lot, of, a lot of resources to bring us aid and comfort when it's really, uh, they're all insufficient apart from, uh, from the Lord. Uh, Daniel wasn't dependent upon the king. Uh, I'm sure he was familiar with Psalm 146 that says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirits depart, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed, gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves uh, the righteous. Uh, God didn't want to deliver Daniel from the lion's den. He wanted to deliver him out of the lion's den. And, uh, and that's an important part to see in this this, this story. Again, so often we can go to the wrong places for, for comfort when it really, uh, or help. Uh, it's good to do what you can practically to help yourself and so forth, but ultimately our, our help is to come from the Lord. That's where our trust is to be. Uh, fourthly, Daniel was delivered because he was uh, innocent in God's sight, and we see that in verses 19 to 24. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. Before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Again, quite a contrast here between Darius uh, in the palace and Daniel in the lion's den. Darius is freaking out, <laughs> and Daniel's got a piece. <laughs> kind of seems like it should be different than that. 
circumstances don't really have to dictate uh, a peace uh, in our own hearts and, and what's going on in terms of uh, our relationship with the Lord. I mean, Darius is, is the king. He's kicked back. He could have anything he wants that night. And instead, he's, he's up all night freaked out. Uh, Daniel, on the other hand, is in the middle of a lion's den, but, uh, you know, God's there in the, in the midst of it with him. Uh, and uh, there's a contrast between these, these two guys. Notice verse uh, 22. Uh, My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done anything wrong before you, uh, O king. Daniel is, is not harmed, he says, because he was found innocent uh, in, in God's sight. And certainly we would say that Daniel's faith in God uh, delivered him. We see that in verse, in verse 23. Uh, he had faith. Uh, he had been uh, faithful, and, uh, and he knew that he could trust the Lord. Does that mean that he knew that everything would turn out that way? I don't think so. I figured Daniel was going in there to, to, to die the martyr's death. I, I, don't, you know, I don't think he knew the Sunday school story. You know, he didn't grow up seeing the little felt figures. He, he didn't know how all this thing was going to work out. As far as he knows, you get thrown in the lion's den, lions eat you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just kind of a, that's kind of a, would be a good assumption that, that what would be happening there. It turned out differently that God delivered him out of it because God had something else in mind. Uh, that's not always the case. Uh, there's lots of men and women and children around today that are martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. They are just as faithful as Daniel. They have as much faith as Daniel. They are just as innocent as Daniel. And God chooses to let them be martyred for his glory and they're taken home to heaven. It doesn't always follow the way this story is. I don't think Daniel had any assumptions in terms of his, quote, deliverance when he went into this thing. I think he had a peace about it because he trusted God whatever he decided, whatever he decided. That's, you know, as, as a young Christian, sometimes I think we, uh, uh, we understand the power of prayer, and I think God is very gracious to us, and we're kind of, you know, we pray and ask God to do something, and then he does it, and we go, I, I like this. You know, you know what I mean? And I think God really shows himself faithful and, and, and shows that we need to be dependent upon him, and he'll, he cares about us and so forth. There's a point in time when our, in our maturity, in our prayers, when we begin to pray, uh, like we were praying for this thing for Josh, man, that God, that you would just heal him, and you know, and this thing would go okay, and there'd be no problems. And diff but somewhere at the end of that prayer, there's got to be, but Lord, not my will be done. Your will be done. You know what's best. I don't know what's best. As an earthly father, man, I, this is what I want to see happen. I think this is the best. But Lord, I recognize you know more than I. You could have some purpose. Maybe you don't want him to fly. Maybe you don't want this to happen. Maybe you need to get him somewhere else, something else for your kingdom, your glory. Somehow you've got another deal going that I don't know about. That's a little tougher. That's a tougher prayer, isn't it? But that's the reality, isn't it? That, that's, that's really more of a, an honest prayer. That's the prayer of Jesus. If there'd be another way for man to have salvation, Lord, then take this cup from me. Nonetheless, not my will be done, but thy, thy will be done. <clears throat> There's some very bad theology around that, that, that says, uh, if you only say the positive, then that's, that's what you're going, going to get. Uh, that's called lying. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> this is not very good theology, you know, as though we can put, you know, God and get him in a chokehold or something and make him do what we want him to do. Uh, that's not it. Uh, it's, it's our lives in prayer submitted to him. And, uh, and I think we see that fully in, uh, in Daniel's life here. Revelation 2.10 uh, speaks of this issue. Uh, there it says, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He was an heirloom. him hear what the Spirit says to the church as he overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. The promise there is that either way, God's going to deliver you, take you to heaven, and if you die the martyr's death for persecution, you get a, you get a crown of life. You get a special acknowledgement uh, uh, in heaven. You read the book of Revelation, uh, those that are um, what we call tribulation martyrs have a special place uh, right around the, uh, the throne of God. God is watching. He knows what's going on. Sometimes he allows things that 
we would not necessarily want to happen, but he does it for uh, his glory. And in this case, he delivered Daniel for his glory. And the fifth thing is kind of where we started. Point one was Daniel's integrity was leading to his promotion. Five is Daniel's integrity brought glory to God. And we see that in verses 25 to 28. And, and that's why we should live our lives with integrity, that it, glory might come to God. Then King Darius wrote to all the people's nations, men in every language throughout the land, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, uh, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. The king required everyone in the kingdom to fear and reverence the, uh, the God of, uh, of Daniel. Uh, he recognizes uh, uh, the sovereignty of God. Verse 26, his kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. It's a pretty good little kind of a worship thing for a regular year run of the mill pagan guy. You know what I mean? It's just kind of pretty good. Uh, obviously, Daniel's had a little influence uh, over him. Uh, he's, got, he's got pretty good theology for a guy that just kind of rattled this off. Daniel might have helped him a little bit with it. Uh, but the bottom line is that the king recognized God's power and God's protection, and God gets the glory throughout this entire kingdom. This had nothing to do with lions, and it had everything to do with, uh, with God's getting the glory through a very humble servant that we meet as a young teenager uh, that now in his uh, uh, older age uh, gives glory to God, which is kind of an interesting little side note that uh, uh, you're never too old to be used by God. You're never too old to be tempted either. Uh, you know, there, there's always going to be battle uh, of uh, our integrity, and we need to learn to trust the Lord. But his was rooted, I think, the lesson here is, is his daily spending time with the Lord. That's how he maintains his uh, integrity. I've always been uh, and fascinated by uh, the whole story of Jesus and Lazarus, and I, I kind of when I go other places a lot, uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll teach on John 11, because I think there's a great lesson there. And you remember the story, um, uh, Jesus is very good friends with, uh, La uh, with Lazarus, Martha and Mary. Anytime he goes to, to Jerusalem, which for him as a Jew would have been three times a year at least, Never stays in Jerusalem, always stays over the Mount of Olives on the other side in this little town of Bethany with Lazarus and, and the two sisters. They've seen him do many miracles. Uh, they've opened, we would say, their hearts as well as their homes to him. And then you know Lazarus becomes sick. Uh, the persecution against Jesus from this um, uh, really corrupt Jewish uh, leadership uh, in, in Jerusalem uh, is growing against him because his popularity is growing. Uh, he basically has, has left the area, as he would say, because my time has not yet come. And he's left the area. Lazarus gets sick, and they send word to him, uh, your friend whom you love, Lazarus, is sick. And that means sick unto death. He's dying. Uh, and then as you recall the story, Jesus delays his coming for three days, and Lazarus dies. And he's been dead for three days before Jesus comes on the scene. As you recall, uh, Martha is not exactly thrilled uh, at this with, with Jesus. And she pretty much kind of goes out to meet him and, and lets, lets him have it, you know. You know, if you would have been here, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, they were very disappointed. Uh, they knew that, that God could heal. They'd seen him heal before. Now it's their brother. They send word, a prayer to, can you come heal? We know that you can do this. And he doesn't. He refuses and lets their brother die. Sometimes that's the way our prayers go. And it's like, what do, what do we do with that? Um, Mary, on the other hand, she's just weeping. She's just mourning. She's more the quiet one. The, one, the only time we see her in Scripture, three times, she's always at the feet of Jesus. And uh, that's a study in itself. She knows stuff nobody else knows. She realizes Jesus is going to die for their sins. She's the one that anoints him for his death. She's the one always at his feet. But the bottom line is that Jesus does come back and we know he has a conversation with Martha and says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Uh, if, if you believe in me, you will live even though you die. Do you believe this? 
And then she says something very interesting. She says, I know that the Father will give you whatever you ask of him. It's kind of cryptic, but she says, she uses a term of like an employee asking an employer, a lesser asking a greater. Jesus, we realize you're the Messiah. If you'll ask your Father who's greater than you are and that you're not equal with, then he'll give you what you want. She had a little problem there, didn't she, in her theology. She didn't quite get it. And basically Jesus says, let me straighten this out once for all. And then he calls Lazarus, you know, remove the, the stone. He calls Lazarus, you know, from the dead. And he comes hip hopping out, you know, and, you know, because like, he's kind of mummified at that point all, all wrapped up. And, um, and it's an amazing thing. Uh, in a sense, uh, what they wanted from Jesus was, he, what he gave them was far greater than they could have imagined. But there was a time when they were kind of ticked off. You ever get kind of ticked off at God because he doesn't really answer your prayers? You get kind of disappointed with God because you thought it would be best if this happened and it didn't happen? Uh, well, learn the lesson of Martha and Mary. What happens from that point on is that that's on CNN that night. I mean, it is in the Times. It's in every major paper. Lazarus, raised from the dead. Now, again, professional mourners are there from Jerusalem. They go back, buzzes all over the city. That event sets in the motion Jesus coming into the city and what we call Palm Sunday. All the people will come out, uh, the, their palm branches throwing their cloaks uh, in front of him, uh, basically proclaiming him to be the Messiah. That forces the hand of this corrupt Jewish leadership. And even though they didn't want to, they arrest him and they, and they crucify him on Passover exactly the way the Bible said would happen. And of course, then he rises again three days later. We would say, well, I'm, I'm kind of glad that Mary and Martha, Martha had their little setback there, you know, because it was only the salvation of the world kind of riding on this thing here a little bit, you know. And, and sometimes that's the way we are. You know, we, we get kind of disappointed uh, with the Lord, uh, but he does things for his good and his glory at a far greater capacity than our little minds can, can see. And if we'll hang in there and go, Lord, this didn't exactly go down the way I wanted. This is kind of what I was praying for. I know I was doing that, not my will, but your will be done. But I was kind of hoping you'd kind of go along with mine. And it didn't happen. So, Lord, I trust you anyway. Help me to trust you anyway. Because I don't see right now. I don't see how this, I don't see, see all this working for good. Your word says that it will, but I just can't quite see it right now. And that's when we say, but, but in the end, I know I will. At some point in time, maybe tomorrow, maybe it'll be next week. Maybe it'll be when I'm with the Lord. Then I'll go, now I get it. Now I see. Lord, for your glory. May, your, may it all be done for your glory. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Daniel goes in. He's a man of integrity, and he gets thrown into the lion's den with perfect peace, knowing that either the Lord will deliver him or the Lord will deliver him in his presence. It's all good. And he can have a peace through that because he was innocent in God's sight, and he trusted, trusted God, and God got the glory for it. I think that's what we really, you know, at least in, in theory, isn't that what we want from our lives? is for God to get the glory from our lives. It's just, it's not so easy sometimes. Uh, and in those dark places, we have to really go, oh well, Lord, this ain't so easy, but I'm gonna trust you anyway. Your word says, I spend time with you. Christ's prayer meetings are okay, but if we're gonna live lives of integrity, it's gonna be because we spend time with the Lord on a regular basis. No shortcuts, no substitutions. And you know what? He's wait, he loves to spend time with us. He loves to spend time with us. What a great thing. Come into the presence of God, ministered to by his word. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just pray for our, ourselves. I think we, as believers, if we've walked with you any length of time, we would say, Lord, we want to be in your will. We want you to receive glory from our lives. Sometimes we think we know <laughs> how that should play out. But Lord, sometimes you've got alternative plans. And Lord, then it's really hard sometimes. Lord, so give us the faith to trust you, Lord. Give us the, the knowledge of your word. That's why we study it, God, so we can know your character. Uh, Lord, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, Lord, that's about uh, the initial salvation experience, but it carries over to 
so much uh, more than that. Your word says that uh, the law of the Lord is, is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Lord, use your word to make us wise. It's trustworthy, Lord, and may we trust you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.